Joined now by former Vancouver Canuck TSN hockey analyst, the one and only Mr. Frank Carrado. How you doing, Frankie? Whew, I'm pretty good. There's a lot going on. I hear you guys got snow. We got snow here in Toronto. And yeah. Everyone wants to talk about Toronto these days. Oh, every, yeah. Every comparison gets made to Toronto. You know, if you guys got snow, we got to talk about the snow we get here. The Cowboys <laughs> lose. We got to talk about how that relates to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like, it really is. I don't even think it's the center of the hockey world. I just think it's the center of the world. That's days. true. That's true. Yeah. So, Frank, what what do you think the Leafs can learn from the Cowboys' playoff loss to the Packers? Well, you know what? When you get injuries to your to your defense, that generally hurts you. Um, you know, don't sign Dak Prescott to a long term deal. Um, you know, I'm trying. I heard Trilovy's been things. looking at him. I heard Trilovy really maybe, likes Prescott. Hey, spread the ball around a little bit, right? Yeah, you, yeah. you don't have to just throw to C.D. Lamb all the time. Like, let's have some different options. Let's run the ball a little bit. Let, let's let's spread it around. So. You know, that, that's a lot of lessons that the Leafs can can take into their own game there. Honestly, I think this is a lesson for incoming CEO of MLSE, Keith Pelly. He's got to act more like Jerry Jones. He's got to be right there in the mix on personnel this is, with all yeah. four franchises. This is what we need. We need, like, his weekly radio hit, like Jerry Jones does, where he just airs it all out and lets it fly. So we can hang on to that, and then we'll really be in business. Like we'll He, really he has to fun. arrive at Argo's practice in a helicopter, needless to say. <laughs> of um, course. Yeah. <laughs> Cowboy yeah. Boy. I've actually seen Jerry Jones, hey? So twice we were going to Dallas. I saw Jerry Jones one time was with the Canucks and one time was with the Leafs. Um, he was at the same restaurant as us and he had his own little area tucked in a corner. It was a um, somewhat famous kind of sushi restaurant, uh, four letter name. And Jerry Jones, I don't know, man. I've seen him there twice. He loves eating there. Look at you on an entry-level salary, uh, dining with Jerry Jones. Uh, you uh, have your Who priorities says hockey? straight. Yeah. You know hockey happens? players are underpaid, huh? You know, you know what happens sometimes when you're on your entry level and, and you're in the NHL? And especially for me, it was like, man, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. <laughs> That's I'll right. eat a Nobu. I'll eat yeah. at Nobu if I want. What am I like? What if I'm not here next year? And then I I passed on the opportunity to eat at Nobu. Hell, hell no! I'm eating. Can't spend it when you're dead, Frank. Can't exactly. spend it when you're dead. Can't take yeah. it with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in all seriousness, in, in all seriousness, um, there's some just delicious storylines north of the border right now for for the hockey teams. Uh, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and the Canucks all cooking with gas. Toronto licking wounds and navel gazing here, wondering what their season looks like. I mean, we've only got seven teams, but we own a lot of the best storylines right now in hockey. It's amazing. It's amazing what's going on. And, and the teams out West are playing really good hockey. Like we, we've reached the point now in the season where we can come to the conclusion. They're not bluffing and they're not fluking. And it's Vancouver, it's Edmonton and Winnipeg. Like Winnipeg does it again where they don't give up more than three goals. They beat the Islanders. The Canucks go on that road trip and they have to battle all kinds of elements, whether it's, you know, the travel or, you know, the games that you have to play against some really good teams, the weather they had to endure. Like that was not easy for the Canucks. And they come out of that road trip looking like a really good team. And last night watching Edmonton play against Toronto, like the Edmonton Oilers are doing things a little different than you maybe would have thought. You think if the Edmonton Oilers were going to win 11 games in a row, Power play, unbelievable. Like McDavid, Dreisaitl, score and fill in the back of the net like crazy. And you watch the game last night, Stuart Skinner was really, really good. Of course, McDavid was good in that line with, with Nugent Hopkins and Hyman. They were a big part of the story. But they get two goals in the third period, one by Derek Ryan, one by Ryan McLeod, and, and they find a way to win that game. It's like that is what makes Edmonton dangerous at times because if they can get good goaltending, and they can play stingy defensively, and they get a little depth scoring, those are added elements to that team that they haven't really been able to put together for prolonged periods of time. Beluga, Garland, Joshua, right? Same thing here. Yeah. Very, listen, very relatable. That line is, is, is very good. And that's the thing now with this Canucks team that, that comes to the forefront because they've, they've kind of loaded up the, the lotto line, and I think it's a great move to have it. Like Knobloch goes to McDavid and Dreisaitl at times, it's like now Knobloch can almost like microdose it. 
You know, he can just put it in in little spurts, right? It could be like last night it was McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Ryan McLeod was on the ice. And, and you don't really notice it. And then, oh, look at that. They're on the ice. But then he'll, he'll split it up. Talkett has that ability now where he can put the lotto line together. It doesn't have to be for a full game. But know that you can go nuclear and get good results and, and maybe change the momentum of, of a game like that. Maybe you catch a team sleeping. Maybe you're playing on home ice and you can catch a matchup that you really like. Like that's just having your finger on the pulse and having a good gut for the game. And now the Canucks have that option. Matt, did so, you notice? Do you notice he was using West Coast parlance there, using microdosing? Like he knows that the only way to speak to us is through weed language. Uh, <laughs> that was his only choice. The Toronto guy gets it. He who, see, he's not he's not doing the TSM thing. Like who says it's only weed? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Mushroom. We have mushroom shops now. Yeah, exactly. You guys got it all out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, soon you're going to be able to go down the corner store and get some LSD and Coke. Yeah. Dude, microdose. Um, microdose. You know, yeah. fentanyl and a microdose. <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, so if you were Alvin then, Frankie, have you seen enough to go all in here? Like, if you get the right player available and it costs you Electra Mackey or Wheelander or first round pick or some combination thereof, are, are, are you willing to pull the trigger? So I kind of looked at this recently. The, the term all in is subjective based on what you have in the cupboard and what you're willing to give up. And you, you have to look at who every team's UFA are, UFAs are. Start there. Is there someone that really jumps off the page that you think can make a, a big difference for your team? One player jumps out at me, and it's been talked about a lot. It's Elias Lindholm. Like that would be a guy that would be a perfect second line center and would, he would be a game changer for the Canucks because now you could go lotto line full time. If Pedersen is okay playing the wing or if Miller is okay playing the wing at times, like you'll have to navigate that. But if you get that guy, then it's probably worth a little more currency. What that means to the team, you know, is that your first round pick? Is that LaCara Mackey? Like, that's that's got to be up to them to be able to digest that but with the way they've kind of caught lightning in a bottle here i would be more open to making that kind of move for that player for lindholm then you get lower on the list of guys and you see names like adam henrique who i think will be a good addition to a team looking to make a run for a championship but now i'm not willing to part with lakaramaki or i'm not no willing he's to not a He's not an all in piece. That's right? not an all in piece. No. There's there's really one player that, that I'm thinking you would go all in for. And with the way the team has played this year, they've probably shown you enough that if you want to make that move, that feeling around the team is going to be reciprocated from the team. But there's not there's not a plethora of options out there where you say, Well, we can go all in on this guy or that guy or that guy. If you miss on it, you're just making a little bit of a move to kind of reinforce things, and you're playing with what you got. Let me ask you a follow-up on Lindholm, because outside of a 42-goal season uh, a couple of years ago when he was 82 and 82, he hasn't really been known for goal scoring. More That's his only 30-goal season, incidentally. Um, now, you're not going to sneeze to 27, 29, 22 goals. He's on eight this year. He's more set up than he is finisher. Fair. And when you look at the Canucks collection of wingers, I, I would suggest they're more creators than they are finishers, with you know, the potential exception of Dakota Joshua down on well, down on the third line. Too. And of course, Besser. Well, I mean, you know, I'm not sure well, what Manko is this year. I mean, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, tell me the fit. If Lindholm had to play with, say, a Mikheyev and a Kuzmenko, how would you feel about that line and how they went about doing their business? I actually, like, I actually would like the the makeup of that line because you just talked about how, like, he is a little more of a creator, maybe a little more of a player who's going to defer. Maybe he can find Kuzmenko a little bit more. Mikheyev, for me, is not a playmaker. Like, Mikheyev is a drop-your-shoulder, drive-it-to-the-net kind of tunnel vision guy. But that's okay. That works. And with the right centerman, that can really work. And having all that speed on that line, like Lindholm's not the fastest player either. So now you have a player a little more fleet of foot in Mikheyev. Like that adds a, a, a little, you know, dimension to that line. I think that would be a really interesting line. I think it would be a good line. And, and maybe, you know, you, you think back at the line that Lindholm played on in Calgary when they had a lot of success. It was Johnny Goudreau and Matthew Kachuk. 
Johnny Goudreau, for me, is a playmaker first, a goal scorer second. That's what he was when he was at his best. I still think that's what he is, although he has that sneaky little release that he, he can score goals. So it's not like, you know, he's had to play with different types of players. He's played in, in situations where there's been other creators, other playmakers on, on his line, and that's where he's had the most success. So, I listen, I, I think Lindholm – is, is an interesting player. He's, you know, Calgary's played better as of late. That'll be, you know, they're, they're going to have to sort through their own things. I think a lot of us thought Calgary at the start of the year with the way they started was just going to be, Hey, move on from all your pieces and try and recoup for the future. I think the, the worry there with some teams now is if you do decide to go with the big rebuild, like the scorched earth rebuild, it's hard to get back to where you want to go. Like, if you can find a way to keep some good pieces and build around that and maybe add some youth and some speed around it, like, maybe you're better suited that way. So that's something Calgary is going to have to sort through here. But I have no doubt, like, if Lindholm was the second-line center for the Vancouver Canucks going into the playoffs, there would be a lot of people, myself included, saying, I don't want to play that team. Like, that's a scary proposition. Let me ask one more follow-up on this. Um, And this applies to Lindholm, this might apply to Gensel, who we talked about um, last week, uh, not to mention any other rentals or RFAs of a certain order that you would want to bring in with the eye to keeping them. In this environment where Pedersen doesn't have a contract, where Hronik doesn't have a contract, can you bring a guy in and sign him immediately? Or would that be unsettling and off-putting to a room that so far has had great chemistry? Well, you you can do it, Matt. But the issue with that is, you know the cap next year is going to be $87.7 million. So you better have your ducks in a row if you're going to do that. Meaning if you're going to bring someone in and you want to sign them to an extension, you better make sure there's X amount of dollars sitting there. And it's very obvious when you look at the cap structure waiting for Elias Pettersson. And now what is that number? Like that's kind of the, you know, the conversation now and Pettersson, like you guys have been going through this now. It's been very interesting with Pettersson. He's like a very closed book about what he wants to do. No one really knows what he's thinking. You know, the, the numbers, you know, you'd have to take a look at the comparables, but you know, he's, He's long surpassed the Sebastian Ajo 9.75. Like, you know, with William Nylander now signing for 11 and a half million dollars, it's like, we're probably talking $12 million now. Like we're probably talking 12 plus. And especially if he's going to go back to back Jack's hundred point seasons, like we're probably in the conversation of how close is it to Austin Matthews at this point. And like if they're going to make a move and sign someone and bring, you know, put that money on the books, they should leave a little wiggle room, you know, in that yeah. 12 to $13 million range for Patterson. Did you know what, well, those, I was thinking those... at least 11, five, I mean, I think the moment yeah. Nylander signed for 11, five, it was going to be at least 11, five for Patterson. And then secondly, I was talking as much about the priority of re-signing a guy as, a, as, a, as much as the cap dollars. Like you bring a guy in instantly and immediately give him the extension, because that's the trade's yeah. design. Whew. But I think with I Patterson think and how many times like, he's already been passed over, uh, not to mention Philip Peronic. Boy, yeah, I just wonder I about also, the. Uh, I also think though that if Patterson wanted the deal done, don't you think if Patterson wanted the deal done, they could have picked up the phone today yeah. and said, "Here's yeah. the number, let's do it." So I think, of course, you know, that can't just be. The team still needs to conduct their business. Like it's a it's a fast moving league. So if they have the opportunity to pull the trigger on something, they kind of owe it to the team. Um, as an organization to, to make their move on that with keeping in mind that they're going to have to have a decision on Pedersen at some point. So like that decision can't hold up all the other business that the organization 100%. needs to do. And as long as, you Fair. know, and I think Fair. as long as the communication lines are open that way between Alvin and Rutherford and um, you know, the agent representation and the player, it's like, listen, we're happy to wait. We're happy to let you work through whatever you're going to work through. We still need to make moves here. And if the opportunity comes up, we're going to have to sign players, but it's not like we forgot about you. As long as you have that kind of communication open, like, what are you going to do? You're, you're, you're kind of working through some stuff on your end to see if you want to stay there long-term. The team's got to make decisions. And one thing I've learned about hockey players is they are unbelievable at keeping the blinders on for what's going on in the rest of the world, in the rest of the dressing room, and all that sort of thing. 
there's no chance that this Pedersen contract thing is leaking into the room in terms of a distraction, is it, at this point? And that's the whole reason why Pedersen didn't want to negotiate during the season because he thought it would be a distraction. But now not having it, is is does any player in that room kind of perk up and go, geez, I wonder if Pedersen's here next year. Or are they just so engrossed in what's happening this year? And I think I know that that's the answer, but yeah. you tell me. No, I, I think you, you, you hit the nail on their head, the head there. Like, think about there, – there's probably days in, in anyone's life where you have so many things going on, and you're like – you finally get home at the end of the day, you're like, man, I haven't had time to think about this or that, and I got to yeah. do this all over again tomorrow. And, like, the day-to-day of an NHL hockey player is so regimented, and it's honestly quite busy. Like, right from the time you get to the rink, you're just so entrenched in what you need to do. I got to work in new skates. I got to take my sticks. Um, I got to grab some treatment. Then we have a workout. Then we have our meeting. Then there's the goalie ice. Then I got to hop on the ice for practice. Then I got to do my cool down. Then I got to get a good meal. Then I go home and I deal with, you know, whatever. You got to be a dad. You got to be a boyfriend. You got to be a husband. You got to be all those things at the same time. No one's really sitting there thinking about, oh, I wonder when Petey's going to sign his contract. You just have so much going on. And, you know, we started this this hit by talking about, me going to Nobu in the NHL because you're like not sure how long you're going to be sitting there and have that opportunity to do that. It's like every day in the NHL, you're just so focused on what you need to do, what the team needs to do on the ice. You don't really have that much time to think about someone else's contract, you know, that might happen or might not happen. There's just not enough brain capacity in in, in a day's life or in a player's life. Patrick Alvin can worry about those sorts of things because that's his business. Uh, he's conducting interviews now, and and he's relatively serene on the outside. Inside, is he a little scared, a little, little concerned about, about the fact that, you know, they're making it sounds like it. And again, we're really only hearing one side of this because Pedersen and his agent remain relatively calm about it. Although J.P. Barry, who's sort of agent number two in this negotiation, said, yeah, it might be time to get back to the table. He said that about a week and a half ago. But it just sounds like the Canucks are calling and getting the busy signal right now. Oh, I'd be scared. I'd be terrified. And and even though he's an RFA and if you know he's not going to stay there long term, you're going to make a deal to try and get something that can really set you up. But I don't know. Look what happened when Calgary had to make that deal like that. That would the proposition of that would would terrify me as an organization. I think Elias Patterson is far too valuable to this team. Uh, he's just he's proven himself time and time again to be one of the league's elite players. He goes about it quietly. Um, and I think that's it's just such a perfect fit. For, for the Vancouver market, like somewhat understated, but like very, uh, very passionate. Like you can see the passion when he plays. Like I think a lot of the qualities he has um, kind of reflect the Vancouver market. So I don't know. I think, you know, going into this, if, if you don't get a, a clear answer, that would, yeah, that would keep me up at night a little bit. Just not knowing what this guy's thinking for the future. Andre Kuzmenko. Uh, pointless on the road trip, although some decent underlings. Uh, in fact, pointless in 10 out of his last 11 games and the only game where he has points is against the San Jose Sharks. Alvin talking yesterday saying, talk, it's a big puzzle guy. We got to make sure the pieces of the puzzle fit. Are you at the point where you just have to trade this player and better deploy his five and a half million dollar captain? It might, like, we're probably getting to that point. If the coach can't figure out how to use the guy and you're not getting, like, he's had a lot of runway. We talked a little while back about, okay, like, you made the decision to sit him down. Now you have to see if he can sort it out himself, whether that's his physical ability or between the years. And if he's showing you that he can't do that, then you probably need to try and find a way to allocate that money better. But here comes, you know, like, here's the the roadblock there. Who's looking for a Kuzmenko right now? And who's going to give you something that can still help your team right now? Like, is, is, is there a marriage there where you can move? Like, it's a, it's a complex time, especially with the way the, the salary cap has been, with the way teams are restricted. And the easiest way to make a move is dollars in, dollars out. Or you're going to make a move where, you know, you're trading futures for a rental to help you. Like, those, those moves are hard enough to make. Now you're going to make a move with Kuzmenko where he's got a big dollar tag attached to him. 
you don't think he can help you right now, but you need something that can help you coming back. I don't know. It's uh, it's it, it's somewhat complex. He's yeah. had a lot of time here to try and figure it out, but it's um, you know, if if this gets like if if it keeps going this way, that he's not moved and he's still here, he's the winner in that because he'll still have a little more time to maybe get hot before the trade deadline. And, you know, maybe we're not talking about that question anymore, but he's yeah. got to do it himself now. Like he's been given a lot of opportunity. Great stuff, Frank. Thanks for this. We'll catch up next Wednesday. See you boys. This is Harrison Price clip brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. And remember, it's all good at Applewood.